I had to do something to get the band back under my command. Thankfully, I got Matt out as soon as I could. He got into like some kind of school thing and then ended up, you know, being at DreamWorks and places out in LA. And I, I don't know why he gave up the mines for that, but you know, you make your choices. Raw school system is, um, is questionable to say the least. And uh, uh, he needed higher education. So uh, it was a very tough decision, very tough decision. In the center of the maelstrom swirling around them, the three remaining members of Screaming Mimes finished their first album, Live My Life. Live My Life came out, and the response was incredible. Uh, you know, my mom bought a couple copies. Uh, I know Preston's cousins bought some. It, it was great. At the end of the day, uh, we sold a couple dozen, and that was, that was really um, satisfying. I see the fact that I have 18 boxes of Scream Mime CDs in my garage as a huge boon because uh, in the future, uh, I'll be able to uh, have those albums with me forever. And that's great. Not everybody can say that. With beer money dwindling, an old friend was just around the corner to turn their fortune around. So yeah, that bastard Jim came back. Um, he, he realized we were right. The fife and drum stuff was a bunch of crap. Out of the blue, Jim emailed me, begging to come back in the band. I, we were desperate. We had shows lined up. We had an album coming out. We needed somebody to fit the bill. And until I hear from another drummer, Jim's it. They couldn't find a drummer, and they needed somebody desperately. And there I was. And where would my life be without somebody else's desperation? Farmer rejoined the band and the mime's meteoric rise to fame began. With a new CD soaring near the charts and gigs lined up all over Cincinnati, the mimes became a household name among the members of the band and their families. The fact that I could come home and my mother and my sisters and brothers would know the name of the band. It was very touching. It was very sad. I think I finally felt like I had had made it. You know that I had I had made my father proud. I don't want to overplay it, but I would call the rise to fame uh, meteoric. We were kind of creeping up, you know, going up a little bit, which was what I wanted. I love getting recognized on the streets. Uh, if I'm buying a sandwich somewhere, if I'm walking in up to a urinal in the bathroom, I, I always love being approached by my fans. So, uh, you know, my personal life, there's no boundaries. I I'm just a normal guy. I'm just more talented than you, probably. So come on up and say hey, because I, I love fame. But fate is a fickle mistress who sometimes tells you what she wants, but then sometimes makes you guess. And then you don't know if she wants to go out or stay in. It's like, can't you just tell me and stop playing games? Anyway, for all their instant fame and name recognition, all was not perfect in Screaming Mimes Land. was great. The money was rolling in. I mean, it was in the laundry. It was in the my pockets here. That was great, but you know, the typical typical ego type stuff was creeping in. The mimes were not immune to the trappings of fame. Storm's addiction to sports drinks was out of control. Price's ongoing problem with being tone deaf was made worse by constant fighting with mimes drummer Farmer over politics, pop culture, and history. There was big problems with the rhythm section. Uh, um, you know, there's there's one thing that, if there's one thing that my father always taught me, it was, Randy, there's three things in life that you gotta understand. Preston and Jim have a lot of conflict. Uh, they're, they're two of the most talented players I know in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and, and when they're both plugged in and in tune and their drums are set up properly, 
they can play the songs most of the time. There was conflict, and, and we knew that we, we had to resolve the conflict, but we just had no idea how we could resolve it because it, basically Jim is someone who likes to research and verify facts. The guy doesn't know anything about history, you know? I mean, he actually thinks George Washington's teeth were wooden. I really didn't have an issue with Jim. I found it quite fascinating that uh, he was able to remember, you know, times before he was born, you know, what, you know, that uh, um, George Washington had wooden teeth. Who knew? To this day, we're, we're very, very close. She's the girl who fell in love. She's the girl who fell in love. Randy's fans are uh, great. Really, it's great to have uh, someone in the band that everyone kind of gravitates towards. Uh, it reflects well on all of us, I suppose. I mean, you know, I write the songs and uh, sing on almost all of them and uh, do a lot of work for the band, and it's really rewarding to see it all go toward Randy. Uh, there were uh, maybe 100, 200, 3,000 people, something like that, out in the crowd, and like, 90% of them would be over in front of Randy. When uh, Randy sang the one or two songs he did, the crowd just erupted. It was just an obnoxious fan base. I wish the entire fan base would have been geared towards the band, but it was all about Randy, you know, the pretty boy of the band. I've heard the word cult thrown around a little bit, that, you know, maybe Randy had a little cult thing happening. Um, I don't know if it was that or just that he's just so amazingly attractive. There's a reason why he wears orange on stage. I mean, that's kind of the symbol of his cult. And it's just bizarre dealing with these, these people. They're just mindless. They'll do anything he says. I, I, I think cold is a strong word. Um, I think that puts a negative connotation onto what I feel we're all about. It has everything to do with love. That's what we're all about. We just love. We're lovers. The orange thing, I've always found it distracting. Uh, I prefer things to be bold and strong. I mean, the world is hard. And Randy, I've heard him talk to his fans about this orange hug love thing, and it's all kind of disturbing. It's a, sp a spiritual being. It's a spiritual uh, uh, um, place in time and in uh, mind and body. Um, not unlike yoga or Pilates or uh, uh, kickboxing, you know. With a certain amount of fame comes pressure. We've all heard the stories, people starting in with drugs, starting in with uh, things that they shouldn't be involved with, and, and Dave fell into that trap, I think. He, he started uh, in with uh, the sports drinks, um, the electrolytes, uh, lights, I think they call it. He constantly had either a, a, a purple or a red or a, or a lime green mustache all the time. I couldn't understand, what, what, was he coloring his mustache? I got close enough to him one day that, that I smelled it on him. And it was, uh, um, it was absolutely Gatorade. <laughs> he lost a lot of weight. Uh, that scared me. That wasn't like Dave at all. We basically told him, you know, if you weren't writing the songs, you were out of the band. And that kind of woke him up. There was an inter intervention. I had nothing to do with it because I couldn't have given a sh